Hello there, and welcome into my sports talk show. I'm your host, Carl Asian Jr., joined by a special guest today, Jerry Spradlin, a former MLB pitcher who played in part of seven years in the major leagues with the Cincinnati Reds, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Kansas City Royals, the Indians, the Giants, and the Cubs. How are you today, Jerry? Doing well, Carl. How are you? Doing good. What was your favorite part of playing in the major leagues for seven years? Uh, I think it was the camaraderie of the guys, you know, just the, the that you build over the time that you're playing together and and just become kind of like a family, you know. And so that I think that's probably my favorite part of it. I mean, other than competing, which I love competing, so... <laughs> So, what was your favorite team you played on in the big leagues in the part of the seven years? Uh, that's a tough one. I, you know, I, I, I have to say the Giants, and, and mainly because, I mean, I liked everywhere I was for the most part. Like I got along great with the guys, and and I had a good time there. And like even with. Like in Philadelphia, I had a great time. Uh, but I think Dusty Baker just kind of had a way of making everybody feel like they were, I don't know, just he got, he was able to get the most out of you without being one of those guys that is yelling at you all the time. You know, not that I got yelled at a lot, but just it's found a way to motivate you. You know, just to, to bring that best out of you. Just, But maybe it's just his character. I don't know. But that, to me, it was, you know, I was kind of a blue-collar player, if you will. I wasn't a superstar. So, you know, to be in that environment, it was, it was a lot of blue-collar guys, except for, you know, maybe Bonds or Jeff Canton, uh, J.T. Snow and Rob Nant. You know, you had, you had your – but but everybody kind of got along and everybody just pulled together like we were all blue collar workers and we just would grind it out every day you know so that was that was more of why I picked that team what was your favorite part of your career in in the big leagues other than talking about the giants my favorite park or favorite so your, park? your favorite park sorry Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, favorite part, other than, I mean, just getting to do what you love. You know, I think, so, I know a little bit about me, Carl, uh, and most people don't maybe know this, but, I, like, I was cut in high school. Oh. So I, I didn't play baseball in high school. I played in some of the city leagues, but mm -hmm. I got cut there. Uh, sophomore junior senior year and I was a walk-on at a junior college and I got dropped from that team uh, about five weeks before the season ended because of missing a road trip but you know it was always my dream to be able to play professional baseball and, and to see it become a reality you know just not listening to the negativity but continuing to pursue it with guys that did believe in me you know I had you know I had a couple people mainly one uh, a pitching coach I was working with Clyde Wright that believed in me and so I felt like if he feels like I can do it then I, I should be able to do this so um who were your favorite ballparks when you played in the major leagues what one was your favorite one to go and visit whether it was the home ballpark or the away ballpark uh, let's see. I mean, LA was fun because I was always coming back home. Uh, the Angels was, you know, the Angels, LA, any of the California teams were fun for me just because it's, for me, it was home. But I liked Colorado's just for scenery. Uh, but then you get Chicago, like with the Cubs and with the Cardinals. Uh, I always liked going there because they always had great fans. You know, uh, 
Yankee Stadium was kind of cool just because of the history, you know, just seeing the guys that played there. And so, you know, things like that was, was really cool to be able to experience. Now, when you played Major League Baseball, did you ever – was was the, whatever team you played for, did you ever play against Derek Jeter or Marion Rivera or any of those guys or what it, were you long um, on by then? Yeah, no, I, I played against Jeter. And I, I I played against Jeter coming up in the minors and, and Mariano and, and then obviously playing against him in the big leagues. Play, I faced Jeter uh, – at Yankee Stadium, he ended up grounding out the second. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it was pretty cool, you know, just being in that era. I think just a lot of the game has changed a lot since then. Yep. So, now, so, how do you, how do you feel? And I, I like what Derek Jeter did, but how do you feel about the first woman general manager in baseball? Well, I mean, she's been around the game for a while, you know, and, and to actually work her way up. I, I believe she actually was with the Yankees for a period of time back in the day. So, I mean, congrats to her, if, you know, if she's you, got it, you know, as long as she does a great job, it's like, I don't think it's going to matter. So. Yeah. I, I think that was a class act because she was with the Yankees and Dodgers organization. I think that was a class act by Jeter. And then you had this year, Gabe Kapler. Gabe Kapler hiring the first female coach in the major leagues for the Giants. Your team there. Uh, yeah. I know Gabe a little bit from off season. We used to work out in the same gym. So yeah, <laughs> that's about all I know. It, it's <laughs> funny. Dusty Baker's still around, and he came back after the – after what happened with the Astros of the stealing the science scandal, and he took over the team. Dusty Baker, boy, he's a, he's a legend. I I, yeah. I I I have I have to love that guy like you like you love him too. Players, you know, like little inside scoop. So, I mean, I've kept in touch with Dusty ever since I was there. So, you know, I was text him and congratulate him just when he got the job and. And then I was also – I'm also friends with his – one of his other coaches, Chris Fire, because Chris was his bench coach in Washington and Cincinnati, and and he's also a member of the gym that I was at. So, you know, we used to talk a lot all the time, and the guys were – when he left Washington, the players were really upset, you know, because they really liked us. And he's just a player's manager, you know, and I don't know if he's – kind of like a Joe Torre, you know, where he could just kind of sit there and let the guys play. And, and you know, he just just has a way. I don't know what it is. I think it's just, you know, when I came over there from Cleveland, uh, when, you know, here I am amongst all kinds of gold gloves and all-stars, and uh, I wasn't one of those players. And then I go to Frisco, and the first thing Dusty – says to me was you know I don't really care about what happened over there you know it's a fresh start over here and you know we just go from there it's like wow that's pretty cool like you know yeah Dusty I I know from reading about him he's very he's a very religious man and he's outspoken about that which I like about him I like the players that do that and coaches yeah he <laughs> yeah. I think what I like about it you know it was he was the only manager I know that would show up on a like a yeah. Sunday day game on a Harley. Oh. <laughs> you know, you just show up on a Harley. I'm like, what? Is Dusty? <laughs> okay. Is, is he, I wonder if he still shows up on a Harley. You know, you never know. I, I that was something I could probably ask Chris. Cause yeah. <laughs> you gotta love him, but also he was on a team that stole signs three years in a row that he took over for. And, yeah. and he got mad when people threw at him like Joe Kelly. But that had nothing to do with Dusty Baker. And the general no. manager of – the ex-general manager, Jeff Luna, he's still saying, I had nothing to do with that. Well, 
when everybody else apologized and AJ Hinch has a job with the um, Tigers now and Alex Cora's back in Fenway. But yeah. I find it funny that AJ Hinch is suing people. Yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't, he wants to sue Major League Baseball because he didn't have any, anything, to, not AJ Hinch, um, the um, general, Ma Jeff Luna, excuse me, wants to sue yeah. Major League Baseball because he's still, where AJ Hinch and all the other guys spoke up and I apologize and I'm sorry for what I did. Well, the general manager doesn't want doesn't want to speak up. I don't understand though how. I mean, it's your job to know what's going on, as a GM. I mean, I shoot. I remember in Philadelphia, we'd see got you know. Anywhere really, you'd see the GM every once in a while in the mm -hmm. clubhouse, seeing what's going on. You know, so it's it's your job to know. And I, I don't see why you'd be upset about that. You should be upset at yourself, maybe, for not, if you didn't know, like, for not knowing what was going on, mm -hmm. because you could have stopped it. Now, but, what was your favorite part of the 2020 season, with it being a 60-game season? You know, I really didn't watch much of the, the season. I I think because of... I don't know, me being kind of a more of an old school mm -hmm. player and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the decisions that get made just due to analytics, I don't quite understand. I'm like, and a lot of guys that I played with or against, you know, say the same thing. They're just like, what the heck are they doing? This is, why are you making a pitch and change if the guy's dealing? Or why, you know, why would you not bunt here when when they put a shift on or what different things so you know I, I just I like the way it was when I was playing and even though it was maybe the steroid era or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. it was still fun to to watch in a sense because it was yes the pitchers were at more of a disadvantage just because of uh stadiums whatever moving fences in or or <laughs> making the balls you know being wound tighter or whatever <laughs> to where uh, they travel farther whatever you know it was all catered to the hitter but you know what it's like keep the ball down don't get it up <laughs> and you won't have to worry about it and and today it just seems like everybody swings for the fences you know and so <laughs> I kind of like the combination of small ball and and you know get them on, get them over, get them in kind of thing, and just manufacture runs when you have to, and not keep trying to you know hit the big the big hit to win the game. You know, just play fundamental baseball. You know, so now if you if you were a writer. Or, or some sportscasters, and but mostly writers, but some sportscasters can vote in the Hall of Fame ballot this year. <clears throat> some of them, not all of them. But if you if you could vote in the Hall of Fame ballot for the 2021 campaign, who would you vote for? Uh, if I refresh my mind, I know Schilling I'd probably vote for simply because of you know, a couple World Series champions, you know, Arizona and Boston. And and he was pretty dominating. I know when I played with him, it was you pretty much figured you had a day off if he was pitching because if he had a lead, he was not coming out. <laughs> if, if it was a shutout or something, he's like, no, I'm staying in, you know, and I kind of missed that part. Uh, I would have to say, mate, <sighs> Scott Rowland, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I like Scott Rowland. Uh, Helton would be in there. Bonds, definitely. I don't care. I don't care what you could say. Oh, he cheated or this or that. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They weren't testing for that stuff back then. So you can't go by that. They didn't start testing till after. And whether he did or didn't, you know, I mean, I never saw guys do it, obviously. Uh, being around in the locker rooms, you never—I never saw guys 
taking shots in the butt or anything. You know, I can I can give you a little insight that most people don't know just because of working out at Gold's Gym in Venice, California, and being around professional bodybuilders and like Mike Piazza and some of these other guys would be in there. A lot of these guys, if they took steroids, would take it in the off season. So that way, by the time they, the season starts, it's out of their system. So they're technically not on anything, but the strength and stuff stays throughout the year. So most people don't get that. <laughs> See, and I, so t there's a lot of times to say, well, technically they're, they're not on stuff because it's out of their system. They did it months before, you know, so, so that's kind of how they would probably get around it if they did it. Just because I know, uh, I knew a guy who used to be with the Dodgers organization and they'd be working out at Dodger Stadium in the off season and some of the guys that were on it, you know, they could tell that they just finished up something because they wouldn't swing too much because they didn't want to tear anything, you know, they just kind of take it easy. But, you know, then it's out of your system in a month or two after that. So by the time you get through camp, you're clean, you know. So it... So I think definitely McGuire, Sosa, uh, just because, I mean, they kind of brought baseball back, you know. And, and, he, and I think Barry would, you know, in spite of his, if whatever, he says he knowing, didn't knowingly take it. Um, in spite of that, I think he still is a Hall of Famer because you still have to hit the ball. You know, maybe he wouldn't have had as many home runs, but you look at all the, the intentional walks he had because they didn't want to face him. Now, if he was if he wasn't hitting like he was, they would have pitched to him more, which means he probably still would have got his hits because he was still hitting 40 home runs a season even before that. So definitely him. I, I don't know else. I can't remember who else was on it. I know, but those few, I would say for sure. Roger Clemens was on it too this year. Yeah. And Had it well, Clemens. I mean, Clemens. I, I would say yes, even though you know, even though what he did was wrong, I'd still vote for him. Yeah, because I mean, it. You know, yeah. from the pitching side, I mean, he threw he threw hard without taking that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the older you get you have to make adjustments to maintain effectiveness, if you will, like Nolan Ryan had to, Randy Johnson had to, uh, as far as the way your body delivers the pitch. Uh, like, cause I worked with Tom House in the off season when I was playing and he worked with those guys and, you know, he had talked to Roger about making an adjustment and he didn't want to do it. And then, you know, he basically told Tom to F off and then Nolan Ryan talked to him and the next thing you know, he made the adjustment and he was, you know, he was getting closer to the plate. Like his delivery was just a lot better than what it was. And so it doesn't help, <laughs> you know, steroids don't help you ha add more break to your breaking ball or anything else. Like it, you, you got to, you gotta have control. If you don't have the, you know, it doesn't matter. And it, yeah, you say you use it for recovery. I could see that because yeah, it helps you recover faster. So mm -hmm. I would definitely vote for him and probably pet it too because he's he was a dominating pitcher as well. So I mean, I don't know. That's about all that's coming to my mind. So. <laughs> and on the first year. And the, and the, on the ballot too was AJ Burnett and Nick Swisher, who were part of the 2009 Yankees team. Which they'll get some votes, but I don't think they'll get in right away. They're not a Derek Jeter or a Mariano Rivera. Oh no, you know they weren't. 
Yeah, they did good in the series, but I don't think they have Hall of Fame numbers. Yeah. Compared to those other guys. Yeah. Like, They'll get uh, them eventually, but I don't think right away. Yeah, maybe maybe down the road, but yeah. you know, it's not like you have three thousand hits or you have, you know <laughs> <laughs> as many stolen bases as Ricky Henderson or yeah. yeah. This is, this is, <laughs> so your career batting average is not three three hundred or you know like a Tony Gwynn or something you yeah. know so Tony Gwynn yep Tony Gwynn passed away not that a few years ago back his son's still playing but he I yeah. remember him when he played in the nineteen ninety eight World Series against my New York Yankees yeah I, I I remember he had a good series but his team didn't show up. Yeah, yeah. Tony was a tough out. Definitely a tough out. He, yep. <laughs> now, um, getting back to you, 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 you went up to the, you, you believed that you could do that, and in my eyes, I went to UMass Amherst after I graduated from Douglas High School, and I got yeah. my degree in journalism. I have that same inspiration is what you do. I want to work my way up to ESPN and work there someday as a sports anchor slash sports reporter. Yeah, well, yeah, it, yeah it's just figuring out, yeah. you know, what you have to do yeah. to get there. I mean, you, you know, you're it's, it's trying to figure out this, how to word this, you know, yeah. uh, Carl, uh, I guess it's like keep doing everything you can do until you've exhausted every opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Because you know? that way, at least, like my dad used to tell me about with baseball, you don't want to look back and think, what if? Yep. You know, if I would have just done this or that, maybe I would have made it. And yeah. so, at least if you if you don't, yeah. then you you can still hang your head high because you gave it everything you could possibly do you, you went down every avenue to, yeah. and and there's there's nothing wrong with that you know i mean there was a guy that i he tried to play professional baseball but he was at i think he was 20 mid mid upper 20s but he never played before Wow. And and he was trying to walk on to different teams in spring training. Yeah. You know, and he, I think he maybe he had a year of high school baseball or something, but you know, he was trying out as a pitcher and I think he was topping out at 78 or something like that and you got these 18-year-old Dominican kids that are throwing 90 plus in you know, it's so funny because I mean, there's. I felt bad for him because he got laughed off the field, and one of them, like, you're trying to. It's like you're kind of a little late to the, the dance. You know, had you been doing this, all the way through, maybe it's different. You know, yeah. but. I, I was trying to be nice to him, like in a way of like, well, they're they're taking a bunch of guys. You know, they they go in pretty young now, and. Yeah. You know, trying to be nice instead of saying you got no shot, but yeah. uh, I should have just said he got no shot because he really didn't at that point, you know, because he hadn't, you know, you don't just wake up one day and, well, I think I want to be a baseball player. No, you, you don't wake up one day. Nope. No. And he just kind of, that's kind of how it was with him. I mean, like yeah. you went to school for journalism, you, guys, yeah. you know, what I mean, it's like you're you're kind of on a path to try to at least yeah, yeah. work your way towards it, but yeah. you didn't just, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's not like I woke up one day and said, I want to be the manager of the New York Yankees. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. It's like, uh, you know, and even for me, you know, I've tried to get into scouting or coaching and at the profession, you know, in an organization, and, and it seems like everything I do, it just yeah. doesn't work out. You know, and I'm like, do they not like me? You know, it just seems yeah. like different things change. And 
So, you know, I feel like I've done pretty much yep. everything I could possibly do yeah. other than take a couple courses, you know, these certifications for like driveline or Rapsodo. Yeah. But other than that, it's like, because now I hear that they won't even consider you unless you have that. Are you serious? Because yeah. back when it was not like that, they would consider you. Now you have, now it's now you have to take certification classes for the for the scouting jobs. Well, I went through scout school, but they they don't. Now you have to have a rap soto and and driveline thing because it's all the analytic stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, I have experience, but I guess it doesn't count for much. That's you know, kind now. of interesting. And so it's not like I'm against learning it because I'm more than happy to learn it, but it just seems like everywhere I turn, I keep getting a door slammed in my face. So I'm like, well, maybe this is not it. Maybe it's, you know, doing stuff like with the Trump sports den and, and, you know, I know one day I got to finish the book I wrote um, to try to, maybe that'll create a buzz i don't know but if it don't it don't no what book did you write about i wrote a book a uh, pitching book and i i tried to take a lot of what i've learned from all a lot of the coaches i've had over the years and kind of simplify it if you will for kind of like little league or high school coaches or, or even college just to kind of be able to teach uh, uh just things you can do to really work with pitchers and because if you know everybody works with fielding and hitting and everything else and the pitchers get kind of lost in the shuffle a lot of times like they don't because they don't know how to work with them you know and i learned a lot from house i learned stuff from Clyde Wright, Brent Strom, uh, you know, Galen Cisco, a lot of different coaches I've had. Excuse me. And um, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I need to try to put the, get all this stuff out of my head, you know, and, and put it into on paper, you know, put it on paper to where it could kind of dumb it down for people, you know, because it can be very technical at times. So I'm trying to make it easy for people to understand, you know, and yes, it doesn't substitute a coach, but I think it, it'll help the dad, you know, that wants to work with his son. Of, oh, I can do this. This is what I look for. This is what, you know, because if you're not taught, like I have kids now I work with, the dads have been around so much that they can literally work with their kid and know exactly what they're doing wrong based on everything we've talked about during the sessions, you know? <laughs> so I, I feel like, uh, I mean, yes, there's a ton of books out there, but I, I guess I just want to see where it goes. See yep. if it, see if it'll be a good resource for people or not. That'd be an interesting them. read. I'd have to read that. That'd be an interesting read. Well, you know, I'm trying not to make it too long, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, but I put, you know, some nutrition in there. I put stuff for, you know, kids trying to lose weight or gain, or gain muscle or different stuff because of being a personal trainer. I had to put a lot of that in there too. And, because I felt it was essential or different training drills or different things that coaches just don't do with their kids, you know, especially at a young age, they don't know to do it. You know, they're just the dad that played little league when they were a kid and they're trying to pass it on to their son and doing the best they can. So at least it, it'll give them something to go by of, Oh, this is how we should train our kids. Yeah. You know, it's like, because I, you know, one of my friends who's working with my son is is uh, Will Aaron. He's Hank Aaron's cousin, who's, you know, he's a pretty awesome 
guy and he was a great player when he played. He, he kind of got blackballed, but uh, for not signing a contract, but he, he could hit. And so he's been amazing with just working with my son on fielding and hitting and, you know, it gives it another, even though I played, it's like, you know, you have somebody else out there to kind of teach him other than me. Hey, Karen, that was an amazing guy and all the achievements he got. And I could tell you, he was, he was not a steroid taker. No, that was, guys didn't work out back then. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, but, you know, I saw that whole thing change, you know, yeah. cause I was always, a, so for me, I was really skinny. Mm -hmm. And then I got made fun of a lot. So I got into lifting and stuff to try to put on muscle, basically to get people to quit making fun of me. Mm -hmm. That was my motivation. And so I kind of saw the game go from where guys were just starting to work out. Cause I know my rookie year, when I was in Montana. I think I was one of the few guys that would go try to find a place to work out and just continue to lift. And, and, and I would do it in spring training at night when, you know, camp was over for the day. And, and then to the point where now, you know, then all of a sudden every team has got a strength and conditioning coach. And now there's workouts that you have to do. And, you know, so it's, it's weird seeing it go from, not really anybody working out except for a handful of guys to everybody's required now, you know, it's, like, so it's you know, that's just kind of where baseball has gone. And I think it'll probably stay there because they see the value in getting a little bit bigger, stronger, faster, you know, the durability goes, you know, you last longer just so. No, but, I was like I was telling you about my experience. I have a lot of mentors in the business. I'm not sure you're friends with me on Facebook. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but I have a lot of mentors in the business. I've been all all over New England and Rhode Island and Connecticut, even New Hampshire, the TV stations, local TV stations like Channel 7 or NBC Connecticut or even ESPN. I have a lot of mentors and they tell me that you keep on pursuing and you'll get somewhere, but they say it's not like you wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to go to ESPN. Right. Yeah, no. Yeah. I think for you, this is like a it's good experience, you know. You're yeah, getting yeah. the interview. As you get, and so it helps you yeah. kind of eventually, hopefully get to where you want to be. Yeah. And so, yeah, keep plugging away. So I always say I'll get to where I want to be with the Lord's hope. And I pray to God, and God will get me a pass somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually the case. I mean, yeah. you can't always do it by yourself. You know, it's, okay. it's God is definitely a, a huge uh, factor in that. So I can see that by your cross there. Well, with your cross on. Get you, yeah, got me through a lot of hard times, you know. Yeah. A time famous, that, you know. huh? famous Kurt Schilling and other guys I've read about their Christian face and Kurt Schilling got him through some tough times too. Yeah, I know his wife is, you know, got cancer, I think, right now. I know she's been battling that. So then he has yeah, he, then he him and his wife wrote a book about he has he has one of his sons, one of the younger sons. I I he was alive when he was born and there was a little kid when he was in so I don't know if you were playing with Kurt then, but one of his sons has Asperger's. He wrote a book about that. Oh, okay. He, he, no, I, well, I, I, it's one of the younger ones. I believe I remember. He, I mean, he had blonde hair. Because uh, yeah. I was there in 97, 98. Yeah. And then, he, had, he had the oldest son and then he had Gabby, his daughter, but there was one of the younger ones. Okay. I, I probably know the oldest son then. I think his son that back then was really he maybe he was too, you know, oh, yeah. like something. And Gabby's pretty much into softball. I've seen I seen some of the stuff that she has a Facebook page and Kurt has a Facebook page. They're on Facebook. But, yeah. Um, 
But I, I've seen some of the stuff Gabby put on Facebook. I'm not friends with them on Facebook, but I think she's doing something in softball now. Younger, she must be a few years younger than I am. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, as far as yeah. kind of runs in the family with yeah. the baseball. So, except but she's not to be pitching for the Philadelphia Phillies, let's say allow girls there. <laughs> well, you never know. You yeah. know, if I. You can find one that throws hard and yeah. can play, hang with the guys. I mean, more power to them, you know. Maybe someday they'll have a woman's MLB just like they have a woman's NBA. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a there's a a lady that's – well, she's in college, young woman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's being followed by the MLB right now. Position player. What's her name? Uh, um, I think it's I want to say Melissa something. I I have it on my phone, but Adam knows who it is. Oh so, yeah, yeah, I I saw that Adam signed a contract with her. Yeah, so she'd been followed by them since she was 16 years old. So wow, I mean she's playing with the guys on a baseball yeah. team. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be funny if she's the first? Instead of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier record, if she's the first woman to play baseball, a young woman to play baseball, to break that record. Yeah, I mean, if she can hang, she can hang. You know, that's yeah. – so, you know, it's it'll be exciting to see what happens. If she, if she keeps doing well, then – I mean, she's on a scholarship. So, uh you know, I wish her the best. Hopefully she, you know, she can make it. I mean, if she gets drafted, then obviously she's good enough to at least get a shot. So, Just like San Francisco hired their first woman coach, and that's history in the making. And then the San Francisco 49ers hired their first woman yeah. football, assistant football coach. So San Francisco was – Right on my books there. I like what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a little, you know, it's a little bittersweet for me because, yeah. I mean, I, congratulations to them, you know, but yeah. I'm a little, it, it bothers me a little bit because of, you know, me trying to get in and I can't and I have all this experience, but yet, oh. <coughs> oh, oh. then you get some. Uh, a girl that's never played baseball yeah, yeah. at professional level is offered a job. and So it, it kind of gets me a little bit, but you know what? If she does a great job, then she does a great job. It's just yeah. me as a player, it's kind of yeah. hard to listen to somebody who hasn't been in your shoes. Yeah. You know, if you haven't done it, it's like, how are you going to tell me to do something that you haven't done? Like, at least comp- – but maybe she has. I don't know. It's like it's like they hire these girls, so these guys will watch the, watch these teams because a girl coach is coaching. You know what I mean, all these yeah. guys are sports fans. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I had kind of that conversation with a, a lady agent who was yeah. kind of upset that there weren't more women, you know, in baseball. I'm like, well. How do you think I feel when I get people I get passed up by people that have less experience than I do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a job, I'm like, I'm sitting here trying and trying. It's like, well, that doesn't doesn't seem right, but yeah. and it's like, yeah, if you're qualified and you can do it, fine. But I mean, I'm qualified too, and I can't get in, so. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Kurt Schilling isn't a pitching coach or something. Must not be into it. He he may not want to be. I mean, that's for me. It's like I'm kind of doing some things. You know, like I continue to work with my kids that I have, and maybe with the like one of the authors, uh, Bill Gavet or. Um, he has a book about you know so you want a job in baseball or mm-hmm. 
we were talking on the phone and he's like, well, you know, when it's at least when it's on paper, mm -hmm. then at least you have some validation of like, here's, here's your knowledge, you know? And like, for me, it's learning the terminology because I don't, I, I don't need to look at a computer screen or a, an iPad screen to tell a pitcher how to throw a better curveball. Yeah. Like I could can tell by the way it comes out of their hand or how they're holding it. Like, okay, do this, not this. Like it's, but it's, you know, I got to be open to it. And so we'll see where it goes once maybe I do that with the book and then maybe they'll, consider it or maybe you know i'll send it some some people i know and ask them to tell me what they think you know it's now did terry was terry francona still the manager over in philadelphia when you were there yeah yeah he was still he was i don't know if it was his first year there when i was there or maybe it was the second i don't know but i think it was his first though but yeah, I, I like Francona. He was a good guy. And he's still around now, which is what's amazing. Yeah. 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 He just can't guy. get rid of him. <laughs> he's a good guy to play for. Yeah. You know, he's a player, he understands. It's yeah. I think that's how he recruited Chilling to come to the Fenway, because Chilling and him were friends for a while. Well, yeah, Schilling said, I'm not coming to to Boston unless you make Francona the manager. And look what happened. He won two World Series. Yeah. So. And he almost went there in 08, but then they, they lost to the Rays. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> and then, then, then look what the Indians did that one year where they lost to the Cubs. Francona was the manager. So he, he's just like Joe Torre. People respect him. Yeah, yeah, I was that was hard for me because I wanted the Cubs to win because they haven't won. Mm -hmm. But then I was kind of like, well, hopefully, if Cleveland wins, I won't be upset because <laughs> Francona's there, yeah. you know. So, which I find funny is Theo Epstein, who helped was a part of that 16 World Series, was a part yeah. of the two Red Sox ones, and he just resigned yesterday. He didn't get fired, he just said, I'm and so, instead of waiting for waiting one more year and letting my contract expire, I'll let the general manager take over and I'll go my merry way. And he said he will, at some point he will be back at baseball. Yeah, maybe he wants a break. Yeah, probably wanted a break. It's a grind. Yeah. It's a now, Joe Torrey, I don't know if you read that. He wrote the book called The Yankees Years. And I read that. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, no, I, I haven't got a chance to read it. But and then your, your former manager, Terry Francona, I have I got the book. I haven't read it yet. But he, he, he wrote a book called The Red Sox Years. And he talked to, and both, most coaches talked about the players they liked and the players were hard to get along with. Like A-Rod was a hard one to get along with in the clubhouse and Manny was a hard one to get along with in the Red Sox clubhouse. Shoot, I got along with Manny. I don't know. Are you <laughs> playing with he... Manny? Yeah, in Cleveland. Cleveland. But you, yeah. you know, Man Manny being Manny. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And then, then Manny Wood, instead of Hollywood, they had Manny Wood out in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, it's just who he is, man. I, I don't know. He just, I got along with him fine, though. Yeah, Joe so, Torrey, he's a great guy. I've, I've met him before. Great guy. Yeah. One of one of the respective coaches, just like Bobby Cox, another great coach. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. Just, you know. Well, Jerry, thank you for coming on to my show today and being my guest. Yeah, thanks for having me, Carl. Hopefully, you know, you get some good reviews out of it. I don't know. Thank you. I put it's it on my Facebook. I'm trying to get get it all over on the trove. But hope um hope all is well. This has been Carl Asian Jr. signing off.
Thanks again, Jerry. Have a good one. Take care.